And let's welcome all of those that are joining us online this weekend. Come on, we want to say hello to our online family, those joining us at our East location, those at our Apex. We're so grateful for you. Uh, I'm excited to conclude our series called Gain the Weight. And uh, the working title for today is Don't Hate Your Weight. Don't hate your weight. Now turn to your neighbor very cautiously. Very pick wisely, choose wisely, put it in the comment section. Don't hate your weight. Don't hate your weight. I know we're post COVID. Don't hate your weight, okay? Don't hate your weight. We've been in a series called Gain the Weight where we're talking about the deep things of God. We want to gain the weight of His glory, we want to gain the weight of His anointing. We talked about the call of Elisha and Elijah when there was a transaction there that happened. And I'd like to conclude talking about the weight of the kingdom. The weight of the kingdom. Kingdom is an interesting term. The kingdom is, a, is an interesting term because we say it all the time, but we, it's, we really don't have uh, defining terms for the kingdom. When, when someone tells you, welcome to the kingdom, what does that mean? Is this Lion King? You know, everything that the sun touches is yours. That dark, shadowy place, don't go there, you know. What do we mean when we say the kingdom? It, it's almost like when someone... When, you know, I've been reading this book lately. It's defining fitness terms, speaking about gaining the weight. I'm trying to do the reverse of this sermon series. I'm a physical body. And this guy went through a book, and he began to define the terms. And he says, don't listen to nobody about nutrition unless they can answer what a calorie is. He said, the only way to find a fool is to say, what's a calorie? And if they don't know how to define what a calorie is, don't listen to them is what he said. When someone says the kingdom, it could be confusing. So I, I want to walk you on this journey to gain the weight of the kingdom because Jesus says it a lot of times. As a matter of fact, in, in, the, in the King James version of the Bible, it shows up over 340 different times. The word kingdom is all over the place. And so I want to talk to you about the kingdom. I'm going to teach you about the kingdom. Then I'm going to preach to you about the kingdom. You're good with some teaching and then some preaching. It's like steak and potatoes and then the pot, okay? So hang with me, but uh, we're going to talk about the kingdom. I've, I've heard it before. It's what is this? Uh, what is the kingdom? Is this a cult? Are you all a part of the kingdom? Are you in the kingdom, brother? What does it mean? What does it mean? Have you ever been in an environment where you act like you know what's going on, even though you have no idea what's going on? Like, yeah, I'm in the kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't know how to define what the kingdom is, but everybody else says they're in it, so you're in it, you know? It's like going to a physics class when you should be in English Composition 1. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know all about that. I know all about that, yeah. I, don't, I, want, I want to give you uh, peace whenever you start talking about the kingdom. Because here's what I know. When Jesus told us to pray, he asked us, for, he asked us to pray that his kingdom would come. Well, what does that mean? That his will would be done. Well, that's what we want. We want the kingdom. As a matter of fact, it's something that's very good and accessible to us. It's actually not just a destination that we're headed to after we die. It can be a present reality here today, right now. The windows of heaven. Jesus came to establish his kingdom here on earth. He reigns in heaven and earth. Therefore, the kingdom of God can be established. As a matter of fact, uh, they would preach in the New Testament, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. What does it mean? It means that we have access to heavenly realities right here on earth. That a kingdom can be established. Don't get me preaching before I'm done teaching. I got to teach first. There are five components of every kingdom. Five components of every kingdom. Five components. John, stay with me. Five components of every kingdom. Number one is there has to be a king. There has to be a king. It is not a kingdom without a king. And I am not the king of this kingdom. Where there is no king, there is no kingdom. Where there is a king, there is a kingdom. Jesus, the friend of sinners, the deliverer, the Messiah, the healer, the rose of Sharon, bright and morning star, is actually also a king. He came as a kid, but he died as a king. He is seated on the throne of heaven, and he rules and he reigns. He is a king. And to his kingdom, there is no end. He is the king of heaven and earth. So we have a king. We have to know who that king is. That is Jesus. I love the songs. Did you know we didn't even plan these songs? Like they didn't, I thought they had my sermon notes. I asked Mickey, Mikaela, our, our worship leader tonight, when I heard what the songs that they were going to sing, I said, do you, do you get my notes? We sang, all hail King Jesus. 
We, we, we sang, uh, who is like the Lord, strong and mighty. He is, uh, we, we, I mean, this is meant to be. That's the Holy Spirit at work. Number one is king. There are five components. The first thing you need is a king. And if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, your king, I believe that at the end of today's message, you're going to have an opportunity to make him king in your life. And there will always be competition for who's king in your life. It never goes away. You and I know this. You and I both know this. Like coming, coming to church is, is, is a pool and it's a, it's a drive, but you've got to put God as king. You've got to put Christ as king. Christ is king over my life. Christ is king over my marriage. Christ is king over my family. Christ is king over every decision I make. If he, is not, if he does not reign supreme, then something else does, and you don't want that. You want him. If you want his kingdom, he must be king. Number two, five components of every kingdom. There must be rule. There must be rule. There must be a rule over every nation, territory, and a people. A king was not just a person with a title. Nowadays, uh, uh, there, there might be kings here on earth, but they're really in, in title, not in function. But our king is actually in function. He rules, and he reigns, and he is responsible for ruling and reigning. So you have a king, then that king must rule. If he doesn't rule your life, and you call him king, but you don't let him rule your life, then he's not king. Because it takes these five things. You can't just call him king, but don't let him rule your decisions. Don't let him reign over your life. I've met a lot of Christians, church folk, that say, hey, Jesus is king. But then I look at their life, and it doesn't reflect that he's, in, he's ruling. He's king in title, but he's not king in rule. So you have to have a rule in order for the kingdom. And if, if ours is the kingdom of heaven, for those who are persecuted because of righteousness, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want this kingdom, you have to have a king, and he has to rule. You can't rule his kingdom. It becomes your kingdom the moment you start to rule. Number three is there must be people. You have no kingdom if the king has no people to govern. We are the people of the kingdom. If you want to know where you fit in the landscape of the kingdom, he is king, he rules, and we are his people. He is our governor. He is our Lord. He is our King of kings. He is our Messiah, our deliverer, and we are the people of God. He, he can't rule if there's no people to rule. He can't reign if there's no people. Now, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You are, you are kingdom people. So when you say I'm a kingdom person, what you're saying is I'm submitted to a king, I'm submitted to his rule, and I am one of those people. What's great about gathering of the saints is that you get to be next to kingdom people. When you go to your job and there's no other Christians, you look different, like you're from a different place because you have a different citizenship that's kingdom citizenship. So the, the, the beauty of the local church is that it's an expression of the kingdom and you get to be around people of the kingdom. That's why our faith is so high tonight. That's why our expectancy is so strong, because we are kingdom people. And, and when you get around other, you ever been around somebody before, and you're like, I know they're part of the kingdom. I don't know them. You're like eating at a restaurant. You look over, and you're like, that's a kingdom person right there. That's a Christian right there. That's person belong. You ever met somebody, their smile tells them what king, they, not me, because I'm always angry, but you know, other Christians, <laughs> I'm intense at times. I just came from a middle school basketball game this afternoon. Boy, I had to pray really hard back there before coming out. And even though they won, I just found all the, you know, I'm just, pray for me. The coach, the coach pulled me aside today. He said, uh, some other parents have been talking about your intensity. I said, I pay tuition just like they do. I get to, I get to coach them up. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I wanted to. You ever met somebody that's part of the kingdom? You don't know them, but you can feel the kingdom connection. That's a kingdom connection with somebody. Like, I don't even need to know you, but I know that you and I are under the same rule. We're under the same reign. We're, we serve the same king. And that's a beautiful thing, too. That's the not just this church, but when you get together with all the churches, the kingdom of God, that's the kingdom. It's an expression of people. Number four, what you need is law. You need law. The king is ruling. He's ruling his people, but it can't be ruled in lawlessness. It has to have law. Now, we don't know about king-driven law in this democracy because we get to vote on our laws. We get to choose what a law is and what isn't. But in the kingdom, 
Guess who gets to pick what the laws are? The king and the king alone. We have no say in the law because this is not a democracy. When you're part of the kingdom, you're not part of the, it's not America. Now, I, I know we love our freedoms. We love our system. We love our democracy. That is not part of the kingdom. They're two different things. I, I love this country. I think we got a great system for here on earth, but it, make, it would make a terrible system in heaven. It'd be a bunch of sinners choosing what to tell God to do. But so when you get into the kingdom, you realize that that governance structure is actually genius, allowing the pure, holy, righteous king of kings, Lord of lords, the savior of heaven, earth, the maker, the creator, the one who created you, the allowing him to make the laws is probably a better idea. And so you have to have law in order to have a kingdom. You have to have law in, in a democracy. We get to vote. But in the kingdom, there is no vote. And this would be totally countercultural to where we are right now because we get to choose what the laws are and we get to choose who we put in place for those things. And um, when you're a kingdom citizen, the king makes a covenant through laws and you just must obey them. The way that the people of God used to express their ethics, their laws, there would be three types. I'm just giving you some teaching before I read a large portion of scripture. I just want to give you a foundation of the kingdom because the Lord is really stirring in my heart for this church to really be a, a window from heaven that the kingdom would be established here, that this wouldn't just be games and, and, and fun stuff, but like we would gain the weight of the kingdom. That's, so, so, yeah, it's important. And, and, and number one is they would say there are ethics from above. This is God's law when God spoke. Ethics from above. We believe that when God spoke, he spoke law. He spoke what we needed to do, how we needed to live, how we needed to, to obey, and what we needed to do. Then there was ethics from below. This came from wisdom and experience. So uh, ethics from above, it was God's spoken word, what God had given to Moses and what God had given to the people of God time and time again. Then there was ethics from below. This was wisdom and experience. Now, we still have this today. The Bible says in the book of James, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. So, so if you're looking to understand what it looks like to live in the kingdom, ask for more wisdom. The wisest people understand kingdom living. Foolish people don't understand kingdom living. It looks like foolishness to them. But wise people understand that my ethics come from above, what God said in his word, and from below, which, which, what's he saying right now? Wisdom and experience. What I've learned through time. And then I love this next one. They had a third component, and it was ethics from beyond. Meaning they knew what the kingdom should look like in the future, and they decided today what the laws would be so that it would become the kingdom that God was calling them to be. Because if they just kept the laws that they knew and the laws that they learned, but they didn't have a prophetic picture of what the kingdom would look like, then they wouldn't understand that they needed to consecrate themselves sometimes. Sometimes they needed to have laws against certain things so that they could get to the place that God had called them to, which, which leads me to the fifth component that you need for every kingdom. If you're taking notes, it's land. In the Old Testament especially, they were after what's called the promised land. It, it, was, it was where the kingdom of God was going to be. They had the Ark of the Covenant in a portable tabernacle trying to get to the promised land because they knew that the kingdom of God would rest there in the land flowing with milk and honey. So in order to have a kingdom, you have to have a property. You have to have some place for the kingdom to rule and reign. What I've discovered is many of us just think of the kingdom as some superficial, like there is no territory. But what God is calling us to is to gain the weight of the kingdom. And the kingdom says, where I step my foot, where I will, I will actually occupy territory where, kingdom, where the kingdom will come. As a matter of fact, the promise of the new land is almost always connected to conversations surrounding the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? It's in the promised land. We're going to the promised land. That's not heaven, by the way. It's not just the destination. The kingdom is not some place where you go later on in life, even though it's real. and That's eternal destiny. It's more than that. It's a promise of a new heaven and a new earth. The kingdom collides with the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. Collide. That's why when Jesus taught us how to pray, he said what? Your kingdom come. And then he says, on earth, Jesus was giving us a window. He was giving us a picture that if we were to live kingdom-minded, we won't have to wait for a new heaven. 
that the heaven can come here on this earth right now. That this church could be an expression of the kingdom. So when you come to say, all hail King Jesus, when you, when you worship, what you are doing is you are establishing heavenly realms on earthly places. You are establishing kingdom rule, kingdom rule here on earth. That makes me a kingdom citizen before I'm an American citizen. I've talked about this before, but your passport in the kingdom is praise. You want access to the kingdom? You want to come through the, the barriers, the walls? <laughs> you want to come through the borders of the kingdom? What we're going to check is your passport of praise. If you don't, if you don't enter into his courts or into his gates with thanksgiving or into his, to his courts with praise, you, you rarely will find the kingdom. You find me a kingdom person, they'll come with praise. Praise is the passport to the kingdom. Many of you haven't been in the kingdom because you haven't started to praise him. Praise is the passport. And, 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 and actual land, actually, God can rest on this place. Did you know that? He is. Do you know this is a miracle that we're here? Do you understand that right? Like this is kingdom territory. Like this is kingdom territory. And the two realms are colliding right now. Our earthly realm and our heavenly realm, they intersect, and this is where we are at right now. And Jesus preaches about the kingdom so much. Now that you know you need a king, you need a rule, you need people, you need law, and you need land, now when we talk about the kingdom, you can say, I understand. It's not just some foreign reality, not just somewhere I go when I die, but instead it can be a new heaven, new earth right here, right now. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Bear with me. I just want you to hear this because it's important. For the kingdom of heaven, this is how Jesus teaches. He talks about the kingdom all the time, but he has to use uh, like stories that are tangible because it's really hard for us to understand the kingdom. So he tries to make it as easy as it can be, but it's also mysterious. It says in another story, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a, a treasure found in a field and a man sold everything he owned and bought the field and he dug up the treasure. Why? Because sometimes it's hard to find this mysterious to the kingdom because things aren't governed the same way. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one, he gave five talents. To another, he gave two and to another, he gave one. I need you to underline and highlight this next sentence. To each according to his own ability. What's the way to the kingdom? How is it distributed? How come he has more kingdom than I do? To each according to his own ability. If you stop comparing yourself to someone else and you dealt with what the God has given you in the kingdom, then you would be just fine. Because he gave you according to your ability. Uh, I'm about to preach this. We're moving from teaching to preaching. This is that segue. This is the on-ramp to preaching. We got off teaching highway onto preaching highway. And immediately he went on a journey. So he just gave three guys, uh, gals that we don't know, ten, five, and two. Then he who had received five went and traded them, Bitcoin, Doge, And he made another five talents. I'm going to define talents in a minute. Don't worry. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug, it, dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. This is not a sermon about money, so you don't have to worry about that. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. What did you do with what I gave you? So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. I doubled your money. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Some of you don't have joy because you've done buried everything that God has given you. Give me a minute. He, he, who, who, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered 
to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler. Interesting that even in, when Jesus reigns and rules, he can make you ruler over that which he makes you responsible over, over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he had, who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know you to be a hard man reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. Fear will always keep you from the kingdom. I was afraid. I was afraid. These other two guys, they were like, bet it. Put it on black. Hit me again, you know. They're like, open up, you know, whatever app you use to invent, put it in there. This guy... I'm afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Notice he still knows that it was God's talent. It was his master's talent. It was the guy's talent. He said, I hid your talent in the ground. Every gift that you have comes from God. And even this man recognizes it. Even the one who hid it in the ground recognizes it. Lord, help me preach this. And there you, there you have what is yours. So he didn't lose anything but he didn't gain anything. God is a God of multiplication. He's a God of fruitfulness and harvest. And a God, when you put seed in the ground, he expects a harvest. And when you just bury the things that he's given you and don't do anything with it, you just have what he gave you. But his Lord answered to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Some of y'all thought Jesus was just nice and God was just nice. Little lambs and stuff. I want this poster. You wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown. Meaning the math with my talents is easy. The, the, the stock is high. All you needed to do was take it to the bank. He's like, I got a track record with these talents. All you needed to do was not hide it. He said, you knew the reputation. I reap where I have not sown. Meaning I, I, I can do this. I, I, I gather where I have not even scattered seeds, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. God wants you to live a life with interest. Oh, he wants you to be compounding interest of the way to the kingdom. He doesn't want you to stay the same way. He doesn't want you to live the same way. He doesn't want to come back and find you the same person that you were when he created you. He's, in a, he's a God of interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the guy that made me 10. He didn't say give it back to me. He gave it to the guy who was good with it. Man, help me preach. For to everyone who has more, everyone who has more will be given. And he will have abundance. This is talking about the kingdom. In the, in the, in the kingdom, everyone who has more will be given. And, we'll have, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Meaning if you're fearful and you hide what God has given you, even that will be taken away. If you live at the bottom line of the bank account of what God has given you, and you don't gain any interest, you don't gain any weight, your account gets not any heavier. And cast the unprofitable, meaning the one who gained no weight, the one who gained no interest, the one who made no more money than when he started with. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. That's not the kingdom. That's the dark, shadowy place. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, help me preach. I know that I've already preached a long time, but I'm going to keep preaching to make up for lost time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just, just keep playing, John. It'll, it'll give me the end sooner. <laughs> uh, you heard of the term three days journey or an arm's length? You heard of the term uh, buttload? That actually is derived from uh, uh, donkeys 
and what they could carry on their backs during the ancient world's construction. So if you were building something, you would ask if you needed two buttloads of whatever the donkey, and I'm, I'm being very conservative with my language. You can keep reading in the King James Version if you would like. It's really not just buttloads. It's donkey loads, if you know what I'm saying. You've heard this before, right? You've heard uh, uh, an arm's length, you know? You've heard a foot. Do you think that it, it was a unit of measurement before? No, it started really, literally as someone's foot. This was, this was a unit of measurement before. Now we have standardized measurements. That is 12 inches makes a foot. But in the ancient world, there was no standardized measurement. It was uh, kind of at random. That's where we get the term talent. It has nothing to do with gifting. Okay, so divorce yourself from thinking that talent means I'm talented. Nothing to do it. It would be like, uh, actually, I looked it up. A talent was weighed based on what a person could carry, right? It, it, we read that. It was actually, it, it, remember like 45 minutes ago when I started reading the verses? It, it, it said, it said it's, it's everyone's capacity, what each was able to carry. To each, like the kingdom of heaven is like a servant who left town and he gave to each what they were able to carry. So a talent was what you were able to carry, its capacity. A talent was usually 75 to 120 pounds of gold or silver. You could carry 75 pounds of gold if I gave it to you. You'd carry 120. You'd find a way to each its own. One talent was was 75 to 120. Let's go on the high end, 120. I just looked it up. One pound of gold right now, today, 2022. God bless you, inflation. Uh, in 2022, as of the time of this recording, one pound of gold, $37,320 for one pound of gold. A talent is 120 pounds of gold. I don't feel so bad for the man with one talent no more. At 120 pounds, this man, speaking of pounds, if you were to go to exchange your money in England, it would actually be converted into pounds. What? Do you think that that's what it started? It didn't start as bills and coins. It started as weight. This is what happens. When, when you begin to gain the weight of glory, you begin to gain compound interest. At 120 pounds, this man had 4.4784 million U.S. dollars in gold. He was given 4.4 million. So let us not feel bad for the guy with one talent. You know, I used to feel bad for him. Like, well, that just wasn't fair. He was given one, and that guy was given two, and that guy was given five. See, that's how we default. We default to compare ourselves to what other people have instead of simply being trusted with what we can carry. It's, this story is not about God giving people more and giving you less. It's about you trusting him and him entrusting you with exactly what he gave you and nothing more, nothing less. When we read the story, we know that that, that guy had five and that guy had two and that guy had ten and two, had one, but they probably didn't even know it. He probably called him to the office and said, hey, I'm going to give you one. Go do with it what you want. I'm going to give you five. But this isn't a, a sermon about comparing your blessing to someone else's. It's about learning to steward what God has given you. Once you learn that I've been given enough $4.4 million in gold, is plenty. How many of you would receive that right now? I'd receive that. You could give me $4.4 million of anything, actually. I'll, I'll sell it. I'll make, I'll make it happen. It don't have to even be gold. It could be Bitcoin. I'll take it. Whatever. So let's not feel so bad for this guy. Let's look at what he did with what God gave him. Because one is better than none. Like, at least you're in the kingdom. Like, none of those guys got none. Like, there's a, a distribution of weight in when it comes to the gifts that God has given you. And it, all of us here, for his gifts and his call are irrevocable, is what the Bible says. He cannot take them back. Meaning, you steward what I've given you. So don't hate your weight. Remember, you got to know this. Don't hate your weight. God's given you something special. Don't hate your weight. Don't hate your weight. God, you placed me in this family. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steward this family. God, I got this past. I got this history. But you know what? I'm not going to hate my weight. I'm going to steward this because it, it looks like one, but I'm not going to bury it. It looks like one, but you've entrusted. 
It looks like one. Don't hate your weight. Some of you have been hating on your weight for so long. Some of you can't get past your past, and you want you just go and, and hide. You go and hide. That's exactly what this guy did. He took the weight, and he hid it. He took the call of God. He hid it. He took the thing that he was supposed to steward, and he hid it. Do you know who also went into hiding? It's exactly what Adam and Eve did. When they realized that they were naked and full of shame, they went hiding. If you've been hiding what God has given you, you're acting like Adam and Eve, but Christ came to redeem you. You don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to be in hiding. You don't have to be scared of what God has given you. If it's one, then let it be so. If it's two, then let it be so. If it's five, then, but don't hate your way. Well, you know, I just, I'm uh, just not very good. Just not a very good greeter. I just can't greet. So I'm just not, I'm going to hit decline on planning. So I'm just not going to do it, you know. <sighs> Don't hate your weight. You might just been given one. You're like, I only got one. Well, better than none. I met people who do one thing so well, it changes their entire life and it's their whole ministry. One is better than none. Don't hate your weight. Uh, an observation you can write down is don't hide what God gives you. Don't hide what God gives you. Hiding is our tendency when we don't understand its potential. It's like, well, I don't want to lose it, so I'm just going to never use it. That's what this guy said. He says, I don't want to lose it, so I'm just going to hide it. Because if I go to use it, I run the risk of being exposed. And God might actually use me to a greater degree. I might actually gain weight, but I, I would rather stay the same than gain the weight of the kingdom. Many of us have put our one talent in a time capsule and it has no power and no potential. It has no compounding interest, and it is time to use what you have. Let me tell you right now, the king is coming back, and it is time to dig up whatever God has given you and to start leveraging it for the kingdom because it comes with compound interest. It will not grow in the ground, but it will grow in the hands of our Father. Don't bury what you were meant to carry. If you can carry it, then why would you bury it? Some of you are so gifted, so talented, so anointed. You've been given so much by God, yet it's so underutilized because of fear. You're like, I'm afraid that if I step out again, I'm going to get hurt again. Some of you are so gifted in, in, in leading a small group. You could transform the, the, a living room and turn it into a sanctuary, but you're in hiding. And I want to call you out of hiding because I would hate for the king to return and say, what did you do with what I gave you? And you say, well, I was afraid because, because I just went and hid it. And, you know, I just want to stay in the background for a couple of years and a couple of years turn into a couple decades. And then your kids watch you and your lack of investment. And then there's like, well, my mom and dad really didn't make church a priority that much. So they just kind of went and hid. And if you're hiding in this church, I'm calling you out because I want you to gain the weight of the kingdom. And when you gain the weight of the kingdom, what you'll understand is that people will watch you. And they'll say, I want to invest wherever they're investing. I get around some rich people sometime, and I'm like, where, where are you putting your money? You ever been there before? You're like, you look rich. Where did you put your money? And everyone says the same thing. Not Bitcoin. They say real estate every single time. Real estate every time. Everybody I've ever met, every rich person I've ever met, they've owned multiple pieces of real estate. That's not part of my sermon. I'm just telling you, this is not financial advice. I'm just telling you, God ain't making any more dirt. And it's just going up in value. So get your house in order and then start buying more dirt. Don't hide what God gives you. This is for someone today that's been thinking about serving at this church. Don't hide what God gave you. Don't hide it. I've met people who are ministers of the gospel in this church, and I had to, like, literally go dig it out of them. Don't make me dig it out of you, because I'll find you. I, I, there's a gift that God has given me, and it's called discernment. And when I get in your circle and get up in your kitchen, I'll say, you are limiting your God-given potential on your life. You better start a life group. You better start serving. You better start giving your life to the Lord. You better, you better get out of those, those little hobbies that you have that are occupying your time and start investing your time into the kingdom where it will compound interest for eternity. Don't hide what God has given you. This is for someone who's not serving. I know no one in here is, doesn't serve, but anybody that doesn't serve watching online, don't you hide on your, on your couch. Number two, if you're, if you're writing things down, don't despise what he didn't give you. <laughs> this is now the official preaching time. 
It says he gave each according to his own ability. Capacity is relative. Don't you worry about what I got. Worry about what you got. Don't you worry about what they got. Worry about what you got. You're looking at the, at the, at the little speck in someone's eye. The Bible says you got a plank in your own. Can I tell you today, do not despise what God didn't give you. I've met so many people. They know more about what God hasn't done for them than they could ever articulate what God has done for them. But I came to preach to a church today that understands he is good. He is faithful. He is just. He is loving. I don't need to know what he did for you because he's done enough for me already. I don't despise what I didn't get. I praise him for what I do have. Here's the problem. We make assumptions about God. Well, he didn't give me what I thought he was going to give me. I thought I'd be in this house. I thought I'd be at this job. I thought I would have married this person. I thought I would have done this. And we make assumptions about God. Then we turn our assumptions about God and they convert into assumptions about others. Oh, well, look at what God did for them. Look at them driving up into that, in that car. Look at them doing all this and look at them and look at them. And so our assumptions about God begin to deteriorate and then they become, it, be, be, it builds bitterness in you because you stopped stewarding the thing that you had because it's hidden in the ground. And now you've gone, you have nothing to do. So you're now you're looking at what other people have. Look at their church. How come their church is growing so much after the COVID? Why aren't people coming back to mine? This is, oh, I'm, I'm, am I being too real for you? It's like you make assumptions about God. His hand of blessing must be off me. I'm a, I, I, maybe, maybe, I, I, the Lord spoke to me very clearly backstage. As my son and I were getting ready tonight. It, some of you look to your life pre-COVID and you're like, I'm never going to get it back. Stop assuming that. Your best days are not behind you. Maybe that word is for me too because sometimes I fall into that trap like, Lord, do it again like you did it before. And what he told me is, no, son, I'm going to do greater things than these, greater things than you could ever imagine. These are not your last days. So assumptions about God, assumptions about others, and then they creep into assumptions about ourselves. Well, maybe I'm just not good enough to have five talents. You ever been there before? You start making assumptions about God. Then you start looking around. You make assumptions about others. And then you begin to believe the lie that the enemy tells you, and it becomes assumptions about yourself. Well, I guess I'm just not good enough. You weigh way more than you think you do. You weigh more than you think you do. That one talent is $4.4 million. It's a lot more than what you think. The English language doesn't do it justice. If we would have told this story in the ancient world, they would have said, man, one talent, 120 pounds of gold, you weigh a lot more than you think you do. Do not believe the assumptions about God that the enemy has tried to get you to believe. Don't believe the assumptions about others too because many people will mask their dysfunction with exterior things and to make you think that they have it all together. But we're, if we're really honest, we all just got a few talents. And they're not ours to begin with. So why are, you, why are you comparing yourself to someone who's got talent from the same God that gave you the talents? I'll end with this. One is enough. One is enough. If, if, I, if I had some kids in the room, I'd bring them up here, but y'all are too smart. But if I had kids that didn't know... I'd say, which one is more? Put this camera on me, can you? I'd say, which one is more? I'd say, if you want, you can choose whichever one you want. Out of, out of these two stacks, you can have just this measly single little, little bill, or you can have this big, fat stack. You choose. What are kids going to choose? They're going to choose the stack every time. Why are they going to choose the stack every time? This is not about money. Because they have learned to look at things by the, the eye, but they don't understand its value. They've learned to count, but they haven't learned to weigh. So many of you have been given one thing, but it weighs so much more than you realize. You, this is only 50 singles. Did you know that? If you, this is half of this. <laughs> is this helping y'all this Sunday school lesson today? Do I need to bring the flannel graph back out? Don't despise the one because it weighs more sometimes than the many. 
don't despise the one. You know how many stones it took to kill Goliath? Let me close this sermon. You bring the band up here. I'm about to close this thing. You know how many jawbones of a donkey it took to slay 1,000 Philistines in the hand of Samson? He had two jaws. You think he did? Top jaw, bottom jaw, just one jaw. Just one. How many lunches? Oh, that band better get up here quick. How many lunches did it take to feed 5,000? Even the disciples. Ah! The disciples said, there's no way we can feed these people. It would take a year's wages. What were they looking at? They were looking at how much. They were not looking at the value that when something goes through the hand of our king, that one lunch can feed 5,000. One lunch can do the miraculous. One lunch can feed 5,000. I close with this. How many people had to die for you? One king, one Lord, one Messiah, one Savior, one Jesus, one Christ died on a cross for all of the weight of our sin. The weight of our sin fit on the one Christ, the one Savior of the world. I came to preach to somebody who thinks they can't be forgiven, who thinks their sins are too heavy. You, my friend, belong in the kingdom of God. And Christ took the weight of your sin so that you could step into the kingdom. Would you begin to give God some praise right now? Thank you, God. Come on, we're kingdom people. The king of glory is here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. I got weight on me. I got, might just have one, but I'm not going to hide it. I might just have one, but I'm going to give it back to God. Come on, would you begin to bless the Lord right now?